Um, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening or good morning, wherever you're joining us from. And um, welcome to another edition of um, the My Career in Tech webinar series. And today we have um, very incredible experts in our midst who will be taking us on um, the overview of various tech skills, including data science, data analytics and visualization, and um, it, and AI slash ML, which is artificial intelligence slash machine learning. And like I said, we have really, really incredible speakers, experts in this field who are specifically going to be talking to um, the new three MTT fellows who are recently onboarded into the program. They're going to be getting more insights on what these various tech fields entails and how, um, you know, to better understand their course when the cohort commences. Um, so before we start, I would like um, our speakers to um, kindly introduce themselves. Um, I'll call on Plank. Plank, if you're here, kindly um, introduce yourself to our audience. Hi, can you hear me, Plank? Okay. Um, Okon Prince, um, would you like to introduce yourself? We can start with Stephen, since Stephen is already here. Stephen, please, would you okay. like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're calling from. Yeah, my name is Stephen. Um, excited to be here today. I um, I currently work as a machine learning slash AI developer relations engineer at Encode. Encode is a computer vision centric and data centric company. Uh, what we do is we provide computer vision software for you know healthcare companies, military um, agencies, and uh, um, pretty much anyone building computer vision um, systems or applications, and they want a uh, um, they want a data platform to build their data and as well as uh, evaluate their models. So that's that's what I do at Encode. <clears throat> Outside Encode, I work with communities, data AI based communities. Currently, uh, um, uh, AI Community Africa. I've been leading that with the incredible team there for the past five years now. And my background has mostly been around data science and AI. Um, I started my career early. As a consultant, moved. I worked um, a f uh, for a few years as a at the mobile solutions company. Moved on to consultancy and also worked uh, with folks in the academia. So I only recently transitioned into developer relations over the past um, two point five to three years. So I'm excited about sharing my journey and um, looking forward to having incredibly uh, insightful conversations. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, um, Steven. Um, Prince Okun Prince, are you are you able to speak now? Okay, so let me just go ahead to um, read out his bio. Looks like he's having some trouble with his audio. So Prince Okun is a uh, detailed oriented data professional with eight years of experience in data science and analytics. Currently, he serves as the founding founder and managing director of PSP Analytics Limited, a company dedicated to providing top-tier IT training and data science analytics services with the aim of solving real-world problems. He has a strong foundation in mathematics, statistics, and geography, coupled with extensive experience and a diverse skill set. He's dedicated to driving innovation and delivering tangible results through PSP Analytics Limited, which he founded in 2021. So that is about our speaker, Prince Okon, who will be speaking to us more about data science. And um, Plank, Plank Dacon is a driven and analytical data analyst with strong passion for data, data visualization, dashboard evaluation, and SQL. And with over four years of experience in the data field, he currently serves as 
a health informatics officer at the Center for Clinical Care and Clinical Research Nigeria. So I'm sure you all you know can see that you know we have very well grounded speakers who would be talking to us more about um these various fields. Um, so Stephen, just to keep kick things off with you, um, would you like to give us like a brief overview of the AI ML field? You know, what um someone who is um you know planning to go into this field, what they should expect, what the course course entails, what are some of the career opportunities, and you know, just to learn more about the artificial intelligence slash machine learning field. Well, um, thanks for thanks for that introduction, Joy. Uh, yeah, um, welcome everyone. I uh, I see that I have a lot of excited people on board. Uh, so yeah, sorry, not my camera yet. Yeah. Uh -huh, perfect. So I have um quite a number of interesting um responses. I think on the chat. So it's uh, pretty exciting to see that people are um are enthusiastic about AI machine learning and, you know, beating AI-based, AI-powered applications at uh, uh, AI has been all the rave, you know, for the past two years, you know, uh, obviously a lot more than that, you know, but it's it's only become mainstream to pretty much everybody, right? You know, with the advent of ChatGPT, um, Gemini, Lava, and uh, uh, Asura, and a lot of these interesting applications that are coming up today. And uh, it didn't start from here, right? There's there's been a really incredible track record over the past 10, 20 years, you know, from uh, your your basic data science, uh, classical data science and ML to more of uh, the deep learning and then, you know, transformers. And then now you're here with uh, a lot of people getting into AI. So yeah, uh, I'll just start off by really um, helping us understand what the terms AI and uh, ML is, uh, is all about. Um, for artificial intelligence is probably, you know, in the name already, you already know that the goal with AI here is just how can we make systems? How can we make computer so programs? How can we make software that can learn from experience and, you know, and, you know, exhibit intelligence sort of, sort of, excuse me, exhibit intelligence like humans would, you know, uh, essentially you hear, when you hear, you comprehend, you know, for example, you hear music, right? And then you hear, you dance to the tune, you understand what the rhythm is like, you know, and when somebody gives you instructions, you hear about it, and then you're able to maybe type, type that, type out that instruction. You're able to carry out that, execute that instruction and stuff like that. You get these things, and you know you're able to hear, you're able to see, and you're able to comprehend. You're able to do things based on the things that you interact with. So that's essentially what AI is all about: is how can we get this re, this superpower that we have as humans, you know, and also other animals have as well. How can we have that? And then imbibe it into you know computer software or programs or systems and, and stuff like that that can enable them as well to think like humans, to feel like humans, to hear like humans, to be able to write like humans, to be able to sing like humans, and and things like that. And that's what you've been seeing over the past few years, right? Um, programs that can listen to um, music and understand you know the particular um, song that is playing. Or programs that can actually generate their own songs, or programs that can generate their own videos, you know, through instructions from text and stuff like that, you know, Sora, and then you're having ChatGPT that can write poem or help you write your email or respond and stuff like that. So everything around that has always been about, you know, how can we make computer programs, how can we make software systems, you know, be as intelligent as we are as humans, and you know, just based on all our senses, our touch senses, you know, in robotics, that's physical touch. Our uh, hearing, our uh, hearing senses, auditory senses, our uh, visual senses, and stuff like that. How can we take all those and comprehend them? So that's AI, right? But on that AI, there's a subfield of AI called machine learning, right? So with machine learning, it's a very, very specific part of human intelligence that looks into how can we sort of ensure that systems can learn from experience. So what do I mean by experience? Obviously, you go out to play in the world, right? As you grow older, you know, from when you were a lot younger. You try to play with things and then you say, oh, you know, you try to jump off the <laughs> jump off the, the stairs sometimes. And then your mom brings it back and says, hey, you know, don't jump up. That's that's some experience you've learned from, right? You try doing X, you try doing Y, you learn, you, you sort of grow. You have somebody to guide you and tell you this is right, this is wrong. Potentially your environment also guiding you and saying, hey, 
this is right, this is wrong, you know, grow, go up like this, don't grow up like this, follow these friends, don't follow that friend, don't follow that friend and stuff like that. So essentially, that's what ML is all about is how can we go from how can we help guide computer systems, you know, to learn from experience. And that's, that's, that's pretty much it. So on that ML, you are having what what's called like the supervised learning, meaning somebody is actually guiding you and you know, how do, how does software system, how do software systems learn from experiences that uh, they actually use data because that's pretty much the only thing that your computer system can, can process, right? Input, output, you know, it collects data, binary in binary formats and stuff like that. So the way they can effectively learn from experience or learn from their, um, learn from their world is through that particular binary through through the data and stuff like that and that's that's just that's just how uh, how we get the experience right to to feed into the software systems now on the ml you have what is called like the supervised learning unsupervised learning semi supervised learning self supervised learning and stuff like that all these are all about are you guiding the software system to learn from experience yourself through by labeling the data meaning you're telling it this is a cat this is a dog this is uh, this is a uh, uh, this is what um, this is the type of rhythm. This is the genre of music. This is the, are you guiding the system to learn like that, just like you would learn, or are you leaving the system to go into the world and learn in its own on its own? Sorry, right? So it interacts with different types of data sets and tries to understand just based on its um, its way of learning from experience and they are correcting itself and stuff like. That. And there's also what we call like reinforcement learning, right? You probably have heard of agents. Uh, that's the that's. Fr the fundamentally obviously there are also other fundamentals of agents but that's also that was what brought agents into limelight is how can agents go ahead get rewards you know when they when they do something correctly they learn from experience when you reward them and if they do it badly you give them penalty and stuff like that so essentially at the high level ai is this really large field where you want systems to be able like software systems to be able like humans right and then there's machine learning that pass ai right now which is like the other, there are other parts of AI. You have like symbolic, you have fuzzy logic and stuff like that. But ML itself is what's thriving right now. That's that's enabling a lot of these systems to go out there, right? So that's um, those are the two parts of uh, AI and ML. Now, obviously, you have the data science world, which I believe some other speaker will talk about. And that's where, you know, you're trying to get scientific insights from data. And, you know, there, there's, there, there are blurry areas between machine learning and data science. But generally, AI and ML are, you know, pretty much more advanced fields on their own in that regard. Yeah. So, and so, what, why, why is that important? Uh, yeah. So, why is that important? Right. I think the holy grail of any software program at all is to be able to get them to be able like humans, right? If you can get them to be able like humans, you can be able to do a lot of things. You know, you can be able to send them on their own to go and do scientific research. Send on your on their own to go and figure out, you know, you know how to book your plane tickets or how to, you know, help you generate new songs or how to help you do X and stuff like that, right? That's the holy grail of where technology. I mean, if if technology can get better than that, let me know, <laughs> right? So but that that's that's genuinely the holy grail, and and that's it, it's important because it, it's going to really help a lot with productivity. I mean, we're already seeing it, right? Most of you use ChatGPT to sort of augment your understanding of things. You might write your email today or you might write your proposal and then you're feeding it into ChatGPT to help you correct some certain things. Some of you use Grammarly and Quillbot and some of these things when you write. These things are already helping correct you. Those things are really there to make your life easier. Now imagine somebody is doing, who is doing like uh, who is doing like uh, protein science, for example, doing research in drug discovery and stuff like that. Yeah, having these systems really help them understand what they are doing and how they can do it better. You might be running a small business today. You don't need to hire like high level consultants to be able to get your business up and running. You can just meet ChatGPT and say, hey, you know, this is where I'm at, I am at my business. You know, this is where I'm stuck. You know, how do I do it better? It's kind of like your companion. And this is where, you know, you want technology to be. So essentially, they are really important because, you know, you want a very, very productive uh, use of your time and that's what technology is there to do is to make your life easy and that's what ai is practically doing these days because you don't have to have high grade equipment anymore to produce videos right you just enter your the the type of video you want to create in sora and then you just get your animations out there or your videos so that's that's quite impressive and that's really transformative in uh in a sense so what are the career opportunities right now so like i said you know uh, uh ai has sort of grown so exponentially over the past you know three three to five years. I mean, I, I started like about, about six, seven years ago or roughly around or maybe even lesser than that. And I know I have seen how how sort of it's changed over time from, 
just doing actual data science where you have to annotate your data yourself. And then, you know, you have to use statistical algorithms, linear regression, logistic regressions. Now you're taking like a, a large language model, like Llama or like all of those things and quickly putting them into your application. So it's, a, it's become a lot easier right now to do AI. But at the end of the day, you know, what, what keep, what's what set you apart from the crowd is when you can still go back and understand the fundamentals, you know, what makes AI thick, what makes deep learning thick, right? What makes transformers? How do how do these things build upon each other? Those are the things that will set you apart in a world where it's it, it's as easy as going to hugging face, getting a model, and actually starting, and then you can call yourself a data scientist, right? Or yeah, an AI engineer, as the case may be. So yeah, it's really been been a lot easier to come in now. I mean, it's opened a lot of opportunities. If you are on the internet about a few days back, you see that some companies already like some a company is already building like an AI software engineer. That's automating a lot of things. And this is not to say that these things will kick us out of work. It's just that how can we make them companion? Obviously, there are, you know, there are some concerns that you should be having, but you should also be looking at how can I make this a companion? And it's opened a broad spectrum of opportunities now because you don't have to have all the knowledge anymore to start some things. All you just need to be able to understand is where am I going? What's the vision like? And how can this AI system help me? So there are careers like an AI engineer or what we call like the full stack AI engineer, they're still like the data scientists that are still, um, they're still there. But of course, when you go on LinkedIn or when you go on these job sites that report some of these things, you see that uh, more careers are emerging. And now there are also careers that are centered around your understanding of artificial intelligence. Like what I do, uh, I'm a developer relations engineer and it's centered around AI, my, my knowledge in AI. That's how I'm able to interact with our customers. That's how I'm able to produce demos. That's how I'm able to uh, improve our products and, and, and stuff like that. So there are other careers that stem out from it. And, and I know I'm, I'm almost out of time here, but essentially if you go on LinkedIn, if you go on some of these job sites and just start putting AI, you start, you start to see some of these job listings that, uh, that might help. And if you have any questions as well, you can always drop that there. So yeah, um, I've mentioned already why we study AI and ML. You again, it's going to be this productive tool that if you miss out on it, it's gonna it's gonna cost you a lot, right? Because so many people will go far ahead when there's an assistant helping them in real time. Really, just imagine a super intelligent assistant, right? And that's just that's just how it is. That such that you're facing any challenge right now, you can write a good prompt, you get a response, right? And obviously, I forgot to mention even the prompt holy grail of of careers prompt engineering, right? Uh, so. These are some of the things we are sort of seeing that AI is becoming, you know, really, really nice because, you know, people don't have to um, do extra anymore in terms of, like, okay, for example, you might be talking to someone in Swahili and you don't know Swahili, you only know English. There's a good translation, there are good translation, direct translation to translation tools now that can help. And this is just making life easy. And that's what technology is all about is how can we make lives easier for a lot of humans potentially a lot of animals or you know a lot of what, what the target audience as the case may be so that's just that's just why we're having this rage and you know uh, it's sort of a really exciting time i think i i'm in the field so i see a lot of things and i'm like nothing it's it's always happening you know things are happening potentially every week right there's a new story every week and that's why i'm really excited about this field is because you can come in you can you know get started where you are you can quickly pick up things and then just go along with the field, keep evolving, keep reading, keep following like the, the latest trends and, 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 you know, with your basic skills, and I'm going to be talking about some of those skills as well, with your basic skills, you can easily start doing something for yourself, start building AI applications that can, you know, help and connect you to the real world. I mean, some of you are already doing a lot of AI with your interactions with ChatGPT. You just need to be able to take it a bit more, a bit further by, you know, adding some other skills that can help you leverage uh, the systems more. Um, so I, I have my speaker notes here. So what are the learning pathways and resources um, for AI engineers? Right now, the field is moving so fast. I'm Steven. That, Hi, Steven. Uh, yeah. Um, before you like go into the next phase, um, I would like um, some your yeah, speakers to just like give us a brief overview and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, all right. So um, Prince Okon, are you, are you able to speak now? Yes, please. I or think um, can, you, can, can you hear me though? Please confirm that, that you can hear me. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Joy. And I'm uh, sorry for the little challenges we've been having technically. The network has been quite crazy today, but um, uh, I, I'm happy you can hear me now. So um, the last speaker, Mr. Steven, really talked about AI, a lot about AI, and he did talk about ML. I would like to concentrate on 
data analytics, and also a little bit on data science as well. Now, uh, so you can, on what... um, sorry, you can just focus on data science and then plan would like take data analytics. Okay, okay, great, great. So let me focus on data science then. So like he said, there's a lot of uh, intersection between what um, data analytics is and data science. Data science mostly uh, focuses on using data as a tool or using data as a baseline for uh, doing predictions, creating algorithms that can do several things, including principal among which is uh, predictions, clustering tasks, natural language processing tasks, and other things. But essentially, it leverages on machine learning, which is the capacity to take data and learn patterns from this data. And using these patterns, have the capacity or the ability to predict uh, some kind of future outcome. For example, you know, I would use an example we can all relate with since we are going to be uh, speaking with people who are absolute beginners here. If you are trying to teach a machine how to recognize the sex of a human being, maybe a male or a female, um, typically there are characteristics that are possessed by males and characteristics that are typical of females. For example, of course, these are not set in stone. A man might not wear his hair long like a woman would. A man might not have female sexual characteristics and a man might not be able to have a baby. Uh, forget what um, is happening now that they say a man can be a woman and vice versa. I'm just talking about traditional um, uh, biological rules now. Now, if you want to teach a machine or even a human what a man is or what a woman is, you would start by teaching this machine the characteristics of a man. These are the features to watch out for. Now, if there is an input that represents each of these characteristics, as you begin to enter this input or these features, the machine becomes better and that begins to come to a conclusion to say this is a man or this is a woman based off of the inputs that you're producing. So if you say things like um, the person in question has long hair, the person in question has um, a high-pitched voice tone, the person in question has female sexual characteristics, has given birth to a child, the uh, machine would be able to say this is definitely a female because of the characteristics that you have stated. So this kind of machine learning is what we refer to as supervised learning. It's a kind of machine learning where you provide features and based on the features that you have provided, the uh, algorithm or the machine would be able to come to a conclusion or uh, classify or if it's a classification task or regress if it's a regression task. The difference is a classification task simply places entities in different categories while a regression task uh, runs predictions on a continuous variable. So for example, if you're trying to predict the height of students in a class based on inputs like um, their age, uh, the class they are in, their shoe size or whatever, and you're, you want to be able to say based off on all of these inputs, a child is um, maybe 0 0.8 meters tall and so on and so forth. That is definitely what we call a, a supervised learning task because you're providing features that describes the output. Now on unsupervised tasks, it's a scenario where you do not provide these uh, uh, features. You do not train the machine based on any set of features. So the machine is supposed to by itself, look at the data which you present before it and intelligently cluster the data into different categories based off of knowledge on similarities that it has identified among the data. Now, this has applications in various fields in real life. Machine learning is used, of course, like he rightly said, in natural language processing, principal among which is chat GPT and other applications like Gemini or perplexity. But it also has applications in many, many other facets of life. For example, in a bank, there is something which is called anomaly detection. When transactions are odd because of one reason or the other, maybe you typically would not withdraw a particular amount or you typically would not 
patronize a certain store because it is not in your neighborhood where you live or something of that nature. Now, if someone somehow gets hold of your credit card details and goes ahead to perform transactions that are anomalous, that are not consistent with your pattern or with your habits or with your established uh, ways of transacting, um, automatically that transaction can be flagged as an anomaly because it deviates from your typical pattern or your typical behavior. Another application is clustering, customer clustering, where you can simply classify groups of customers because of their behaviors. It's usually very, very important. It's a very important task in many business applications. For example, your um, telecom service provider would typically cluster customers into various categories and target them with advertising based on their clusters or their character. So this is yet another application of uh, machine learning. You can also apply machine learning in the case of um, uh, uh, cases where you have inventory, online inventory, like online stores, Jumia, Konga, for example. They should be able to predict what the customers would need based on the pattern of sales over time. So that is also an application of machine learning. There is also what is called time series prediction. It is very useful in uh, using algorithms to predict cryptocurrency prices, uh, stock uh, prices, and things like weather. You just use um, what you have observed from the past to be able to predict the future. So that is called time series analysis, also a very important task in machine learning. Machine learning is a field that is becoming more and more important as time goes. There are different areas. There is also something called computer vision, which is also quite popular, which is in essence, teaching computers to recognize images. That has applications in many, many fields or many ways. For example, you could see an automatically operated door where uh, maybe during COVID, for instance, the door automatically does not open if you're approaching the door and you're not wearing a face mask. Somebody does not have to be behind the door operating the door by closing and opening it. We can teach uh, we can create an algorithm, a computer vision algorithm that can look at people's faces and recognize if they are wearing masks or not wearing masks and react accordingly. So that algorithm can be programmed to open up the door if the person is not wearing a mask and close up the door if the person is wearing a mask to deny the person entrance to that facility. So these are all many different applications of machine learning. And recently, the quantity of data that is generated by people in their daily lives is astronomical. And the possibilities of things that can be done with this data by harnessing this data, we always hear things like Google is the uh, most profitable company in the world and all of that. The top five companies in the world are um, uh, data-based companies or IT companies. That is because they have found the golden key to unlock insights and the value that exists in data. And it is data scientists, data analysts, data professionals that enable them to do these things. What these people do is that they create different ways so through data analytics, through data science, by uh, creating algorithms that can quickly manipulate or handle data at scale and extract insights from this data and also create algorithms that can work on this data for different tasks, prediction tasks, and other kinds of tasks as well. Now, when it comes to um, recent developments in the computer science field, there has been a lot of improvements in GPUs, in GPU technology. So right now, the kind of data that could not be chunked before, data that were simply just too massive to be handled or to be processed. The capacity to process data is increasing every single day. For instance, Google Colab, which is a service by um, Google, provides you with up to 16 gigabyte RAM of data and a GPU. These are services that you would have to pay through your nose to get before. And this is provided absolutely for free for anyone who is willing to go through the process of learning how to manipulate data, how to use data, and the need continues to increase because the quantity of data that is generated continues to increase. 
There are 5 million hours of videos that are watched daily. 500,000 hours of videos are uploaded to YouTube alone. There are billions and billions of searches on Google, on Facebook, thousands and uh, thousands of weather reports that are accessed every day. People receive billions of mails every day. These are all data that can be chunked, can be manipulated, can be processed to extract insight. And it is the job of a data scientist to extract these insights, come up with algorithms for these data to be pre-processed. Now, what are the tools that you're supposed to be good with? First and foremost, you're supposed to be good with math. I know some people would always say you don't need math to get into data science or data analytics, but yes, you do need at least the basics of mathematics. You may not be super uh, capable when it comes to your mathematical prowess, but you are not going to escape from topics like regression, probability, number theory. There are some basic things that you will not escape if you want to be a proficient data scientist. So these things are the mathematical side of things. Of course, there are tools that help to make these things easy, but you must understand the basics and how they work. And that would help you in executing your duty or prosecuting your work as a data scientist. Next, you need to be prepared to be good with programming. There are two languages that are basically used, uh, that is R, and Python, those are the two most popular languages. That is not to say other languages are not used as well. But uh, for the purpose of this program, that is a three entity program, we are using Python for all of our programming. Now, you, there are lots of tools that make programming easy, so that shouldn't scare anyone. But yes, just know that that is something you have to commit yourself to learn. You have to understand how programs work. You have to understand how libraries work. You have to understand how to use them to your advantage to create algorithms that are going to be able to work for you. Now, um, aside from that, we also have to consider deployment. Deployment is another thing that is really, really important because after you have created your wonderful algorithm, the next question is how is it going to be used? Yes, this is essentially a data engineer's task, deployment but it helps for a data scientist to understand the basics of deployment because it helps you. If you know that this is the end users of your, your product and this is most likely how this product will be used, it will influence you in the way you create it so that it will be very useful and very accessible to the end users. So to, to summarize it, because I know that um, I may not have so much time because of the time constraints uh, regarding this particular webinar. To do or the things you need to learn or what you can expect is that you're going to be working with a lot of data. And what you're going to be doing will be manipulating this data using programs like Python. Python in particular would be used to manipulate this program. You should also be friendly, be willing, be open to you know, using math to solve problems. You should also be open to learning other methods of um, presentation, presenting your, uh, what you have found, because essentially a data science task can be split into sourcing your data, which is actually collecting the data. How do you collect data? You can collect data by uh, scraping data from websites. You can collect data by creating questionnaires that's going to help you get the data. You can create Google Forms to extract data from people. You can help companies create end-to-end -end projects by first defining a data collection strategy that will maintain the integrity of the data that you're collecting. Because at the end of the day, your model or the algorithm you build is just as good as the data from which they are built. The data is a raw material that you're going to be working with. Right after you collect the data, you do what is called EDA or exploratory data analysis. That is mainly the the most similarity you have with a data analyst, because at this point, you begin to extract insights, you get to understand your data. You know, what are the missing values that are contained in the data? What is the size of your data? What is the uh, basic statistical characteristics of this data? Are there any usual uh, uh, helpful visualizations you can create from this data to help you understand it better? 
all of this happens at the level of EDA, where you get to really, really understand your data and decide what you want to do. After that, you come into the area uh, which I would like to call algorithm development. In algorithm development, you decide what you're doing. If it's a machine learning task, is it going to be a classification task? Is it going to be a regression task? Are you going to just be doing clustering? Do you simply want to uh, 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 curate this data in a better way so that it can be easily accessed by the people who would use them? So you have to decide what you do and put together the tools that helps you to achieve this. Of course, with the deployment in mind, how are you going to deploy it? Do you deploy it in the form of an app? Are you going to deploy it by creating a website and uploading it there? Are you going to create a streamlit app? Is it just going to be in an API where people can get access to it through usernames and passwords and stuff like that. So you decide how you are going to actually make this data or this thing that you have developed available to the final consumers that are going to use them. Then there is something I like to call data-centric thinking. In fact, it's one of the most important things that you would learn as a data um, professional. Hi, hi, um. Hi, yes, Prince Okun. Before you yeah. um go um, further into talking about the data science field, um, so far you've spoken extensively um around what's that field, what the field, the data science field entails. You know what people yeah. should look for to actually our new fellows, and I lo love the fact that um you also brought up the mathematical aspects because I know that's like um I don't know if I should call it a misconception because some people say oh you need maths, another people say oh well, you don't need maths, or uh, well, you know things like that have come up in um discussions around data science. So I'm really glad that you got to clarify yeah. that. Um, so I'm just going to confirm with um, Plang if he's able to speak now for we'll proceed further. Yes, I don't know whether you can hear me now. Yes, okay. yes, you can. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So yep. um, I'd like you to just give like a brief overview of what the um, data... Thank you so much. Can you can you hear me? Am I audible? Okay, looks like we lost him there. Um, so just um to put this out there to our audience, um, we are checking the chat session. So if you have any questions, so all our fellows listening out there, if you have any questions about this various field, feel free to put that in the chat session, and we will ensure to take that along as we proceed in this webinar. Um, so just um taking it back to you, Stephen. You um, there's this question that I've seen um, you know, recurrently on the chat session, and some people are like, "Oh, um, I want to start a field in um, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Are there some prerequisite knowledge that I need to have before delving into this field?" Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So for the for the prerequisites for um, AI and ML, I think, like I said, it's been the field has changed quite a lot now that, you know, if you truly want to get into AI engineering, you need to not just have a lot of software engineering skills, but you need to also have skills in ML, like uh, machine learning itself. So when I mean software engineering skills, like I mentioned Python, you know, if you've built Python apps before, if you've built apps with JavaScript or stuff like that, you know, you already have like one like that because, you know, uh, you know, these days, you know, it's not about, it's, it's less about building models and more about, you know, focusing on the data, trying to get your models to users and, uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. So that, that is sort of what the focus is this day. So you need, you know, your knowledge of Python, you know, or JavaScript, these are, these are two, you know, uh, JavaScript and Rust, these are three programming languages out there that most of these recent AI tools are, you know, built in or have compatibility with well, fundamentally Python, at least uh, you need to have that, you need to have that knowledge. Then the other one is machine learning. So I think this is where your math, uh, your knowledge of math and, you know, and statistics will probably come in as well. Uh, you need to be able to understand how to, you know, do, you know, understand things like calculus, 
Um, I, I know, I, I think there are very specific courses these days that offer math for data science or math for ML. So calculus, your linear algebra, your optimization, those are like three three interesting topics that you should be able to get under your belt, especially calculus, you know, so that you'd be able to work with more advanced on structured data sets. So that's, um, that's another thing you need to have. Uh, like I said, statistics, because as you run in AI engineering, there's a part of AI engineering called like, you know, you, you meant to help, you know, understand the issues with your data, data distribution shifts and stuff like that. And those require statistical knowledge for you to have as well. So you need to have that fundamental um, skills. And then you need to also have some form of research skills. Now, this is really important uh, because you're going to be doing a lot, of res uh, a lot of researching about things, you know, because a lot of things in this field is really forming. And this is not something that any school or bootcamp would tell you to have. But the truth of the matter is you need to have it, right? A lot of things are still forming in this industry. Things are coming up every single week, right? You need to be able to understand where to look out for, what to look out for, and see how to quickly experiment and apply some of these knowledge to your, you know, to, to what you're particularly building. So yes, one, software engineering skills, definitely Python, and then have an understanding of how to build an actual software solution. So coding Python, not just understanding Python at a basic level, you know, but understanding it well enough to be able to build some form of computer program around. Then two, like I said, you know, the math, you need to understand the calculus, the linear algebra, the optimization. These are three cause optimization. You have what we call gradient descent. You know, you're, you're going to be using that as well um, in some areas. So, and then your statistics knowledge, you need to be able to have uh, of that under your belt. Now, uh, uh, yeah, uh, of course, the research. Now, I think those are really the fundamental skills that I see right now. Every other thing, obviously, you can learn along the way. And trust me, obviously, math is a whole world of bachelors on its own. You know, stats is a whole world of bachelors, but you need to pick your battles, right? Uh, I, I like to say that the, the easiest way to really get started with this stuff is learn, you know, under, understand the fundamentals of what AI is. I think there are really good courses that are put out there, what artificial intelligence is and stuff like that, and just start to build stuff. So quickly go to, you know, Hugging Face. If you have good knowledge of Python already, see how to use their documentation to use their model and then use it to make a prediction or use it to run a translation task or something like that. Get your hands dirty real quick so that you, you don't know what, you might not know what you're doing, but it's giving you a sense of getting things done because that that's really what the AI space is all about these days. It's not about having theoretical knowledge these days. You want to get out there and practice as soon as possible. You know, all these things, rags and everything, these things are changing really fast. So you need to understand how to get started practicing, but also in your spare time or your crucial time, be able to understand those fundamentals. Go learn those fundamentals so that you stand out from the crowd. Like I said, anybody can go to Hugging Face and use their API or call an open AI API GPT-3, Turbo, and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, what sets you apart as a really interesting talent from the onset, not just when you've advanced, from the onset is you understand the fundamentals. And that's, I think, what will keep distinguishing engineers and, and, and developers going forward as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think you did justice to that question, Stephen. Um, Frank, are you with us now? Yes. Yeah, the network is crazy. Okay, I'm struggling to hear you. I don't know whether you can hear me now. Yes, yeah, actually, but it's... Yeah, sorry uh, about that. Okay, okay, it's clear now. All right, thank you so much. So I'm supposed to talk about data visual analysis and visualization. So... Good evening once more. I'm sorry about the technical glitches that we're having. So the data analysis involve examining um, um data analysis involve examining structured and unstructured data to, to extract valuable insights for stakeholders. So as a data analyst, most of the times you'll be working with unstructured data because most organizations do collect unstructured data. Only few organizations that may few occasions sometimes you might be able to uh, work with structured data. So for the visualization is the trans is the graphical representation of the data. That's the structured data that you're able to transform. That's where you're able to visualize using um, graphics like um, like graphs, like charts the bar chart, the pie chart, the line chart, and a whole lot of. So why is it important for 
for you to, to, to study data analysis. And data analysis is so much in demand these days. Every day, a lot of data is being generated. So as currently we are right now, we are currently generating data currently hosting this. So you can imagine it's, 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 it's a platter of a lot of opportunities inside. So it also gives you for career opportunities such as data analysis is being applied in almost all the sector of, of, of the industry right now. You can use it in the business, the healthcare, the financial, the investment. So where, why, why it's important for you to, to, to study such is that it will give you a lot of career opportunities. And it also improves your problem solving because most of the time, as a data analyst or as a data um, engineer or as a data um, data person, to be precise, you'll be focusing on trends and patterns. So you are able to know how to solve technical issues. You're able to figure out, you're able to bring life to your data. And why also you, you need to study data analysis? Also, it also gives room for, um, for high earning potentials. Like when you are expert in this field, you can be able to um, earn higher. I know some of most of us that are joining this program are, are, are eager and believing after the whole thing, after the whole learning process, we would like to also earn higher. So this will also give you opportunity. And then one thing about data analysis is there is career growth and, and learning because um, technologies keep evolving. Today you are on this, tomorrow you are on that. So you also need to also keep up with your learning graphs because as it is right now, the common visualization tools are Power BI, Tableau and rest. But by tomorrow, you might see another new technology must come uh, will come in. So that's why it's 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 it gives you room for always career growth because you always keep on learning. So the potential that it offers. Um earlier speakers have talked about um, data science uh, being it be a data scientist. Yes. You can, after all these studies, you can decide to say, okay, this is what I want to be. I want to be a data analyst. Whereas you being a data analyst, you 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 collect, uh, analyze, and transform data. So this this. Hello, Joy. Please, if you're talking, you're muted, so I can't. We can't hear you. Oh gosh, so sorry about that. Okay, so I said um, there's a question. Why um, Plan was talking? There's a question I came across, which was also in line with what he was saying. And the question goes this way: the person is asking, "What is the difference between data analysis and data science in terms of you know career prospects and?" Um, job expectations, and I was hoping if you could um, address that. Okay, thank you very much. Now, the major difference between data analytics and data uh, science is that data analytics is largely diagnostic. What that means is that it just shows you what the data is saying. It helps you to see very clearly what your data is saying, what the story your data has to tell. So the tools for doing that is the visualization tools, which could be Power BI, Tableau, or Matplotlib, Seaborn, which are tools within Python that you can use for visualization. But in itself, data 
uh, visualization and analytics might not solve a problem. It simply tells you very clearly, this is what your data is saying. For example, if your data is saying that there is very, very little female enrollment in computer science within a university, data visualization shows you that. You do a bar chart and it shows you that female to male ratio is 20 to 80, for example. So you see that very clearly. While most times data science wants to create algorithms that takes action. So for example, if you're creating a predictive model, the model is taking data from three years over time, which a data analyst can visualize and tell you in the past three years, rainfall has continually been increasing or reducing. It can tell you that there has been flood prevalence in certain areas and all of this then you as a data scientist can take that same data and use the figures that have been collected over time to predict the next incident of flood. So for example, if you have rainfall data and there's a correlation between volume of rainfall and flood incidents, your um, algorithm which you create via the process of doing your job as a data scientist can look at the data and tell you with relative accuracy, which would be how, uh, determined by how good your model ends up being, how likely it is for you to end up having a flood incident based on factors like the volume of rainfall, the location where the rain fell, the proximity of that location as regards to its closeness to a river channel or something like that, and drainage blockages and all of that. So uh, that's the difference. I hope I made uh, sense in the explanation. But what the take home here is that visualization and data analytics is diagnostic. While data science try to create a solution by creating an algorithm, it could be a predictive algorithm, it could be a clustering algorithm, it could be a classification algorithm, it all depends on your understanding of the problem and the route you choose to travel to solve it. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, here's another question I picked up from the chat section. Um, the question is, how long will it, will it take one to be job ready for AI ML, for that, for artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, Steven, I'd like you to take that and if possible, also give like a general um, overview of your thoughts on how long it also takes someone to be job ready in, you know, the data um, fields since they are all closely linked together. Yeah, so that, that's a question I was hoping wouldn't show up at all, you know. Uh... But yeah, it has. And it's a question I've avoided over the past four years. Sometimes when I have chats like this is uh, um, how long is very subjective, to be honest. You know, it's it's very dependent on the the learner. A lot of variables play into how, you know, fast, you know, you think you're sort of job ready. All right. And the the assessment I, tr I tend to put is that you you spend more time practicing than, you know, you know, then learning all the theoretical angles and so which which are the theoretical angles are really good, you know, get those fundamentals and everything. But, you know, you would know your job ready when you've practiced well enough to know that, okay, I can go from deploying this small AI model that does something from my collab notebook to, you know, going and putting that behind an API to work with, uh, with, uh, with uh, to sort of like be called by by backend engineer or be called by an app engineer as the case may be and stuff because AI models don't work in isolation, right? They work with actual software solutions. So you're either uh, linking it with a mobile app or you're either linking it with a website or you're deploying it on the edge you know, edge computing on the phone directly or uh, so it, it doesn't work in isolation, right? The only time it works in isolation is when you're using this in your collab notebook. And trust me, where are your users? Your users are either using users of these things are either on you know their computer or they're either on websites or either or they're either in a uh, mobile application. You want to get the mobile uh, the models to them. So it, how long is really subjective? Like I said, you could be ready in three months, and that's that's if you're superhuman. To be fair, but these things take time, 
And it takes a lot of practice for you to get this done, but you don't have to be an expert to really say you are job ready. Like I mentioned, getting started from the onset practicing is what you would do you more good right now. If you had asked me this question two years ago, right, before this craze, I would have told you, you know, go through Python and then go through deep learning and then go through all of these things. But I, I see this things. I see that the field is really changing. So I, I, I mean, I wouldn't tell you to start going through all this long process, but I, I tell you, once you nail down those fundamentals, like I said, you know, getting those, like the Python, once you have knowledge of Python, you know, quickly, you know, with your limited knowledge, or at least the fundamental knowledge of what AI is, you get the terminologies right, like what the model look, what, what the model is, what data is, and some of these things that are peculiar to the AI field. Go to something like Hugging Face, where they are open source models, and try to test things out with your Python skills, right? To see where those flaws are quickly, and then start learning those those ML uh, centric fundamentals to sort of push you more uh, towards the right path in your career, and then. The more you practice, the more you, you know, like I said, go into models, see the issues and, and stuff like that, the better, right? I wouldn't give you a, a specific length of time, but I will say that the more you practice, the more you realize whether you're actually uh, a lot more a lot ready or not. And that's why you need programs that are, you know, very project centric, meaning you've learned the fundamentals. People are pushing you towards actually working on projects, because if you've done three, four projects that are projects that you come up with yourself, not just projects you randomly see on the internet. I think you should be you should be job ready. If those projects are successful, or well, at least you know fifty percent or sixty percent of those projects that you do yourself that you come up with. So meaning, uh, if we look at the ML data science timeline, you you go and get the data set somewhere. Maybe you annotate if you can, or if you if you can't, just get a a, a ready data set. You take that data set, you clean, preprocess. You know you know you argument as the case may be. You know you 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 sort of use your Python skills to really. Uh, tease out the most important parts of the data or select the most important features of the data set, feature engineering as the case may be, and then take that data set, you know, if you can, you know, build models from scratch. Otherwise, it is nobody builds models from scratch, <laughs> just a few people, right? So you get you get the model off like a, a platform and then use that model to, you know, to uh, sort of uh, predict something or, you know, use that model on your data set or fine tune the model on your data set and then put that, uh, model into what we call production, meaning maybe like a streaming app, like the uh, like the speaker rights for this set, or an API. You know, if you can be the Flask or Django API uh, through with Flask or Django, sorry, or use Fast API, and then somebody can call your API, maybe from a command line or from an app or from a website and stuff like that. If you've done that end to end, you do that for like three projects, you should be ready. I mean, you don't cheat. Like, you know, the only cheating you do is probably going on the internet or using co-pilots to code and everything. But you just go through that process end to end. I think if you've done that three times, you should be able to say, hey, you know, these are three solid projects I've come up with myself. And then anybody will be interested, especially if those are interesting and hard problems you're solving. So look at some of the hard projects you can do and generally find, you know, also find mentors. I think, I believe this program will be able to provide mentors as well for you as well say hey you know this is the project i want to work on you know find people who can guide you as you know as you get stuck and you know try to unblock you as well but like i said get started working on projects and then the more projects that are your own meaning it's not something you grab from the internet and you know put on your github repository and stuff the more projects that are your own that you do the more you feel a lot ready to you know apply for that project because at the end of the day that's still still the same thing you're going to be doing in the job as well coming up with project ideas or working with other people's ideas to implement them and get them to users, yeah. Obviously, this is apart from the soft skills and everything. And I, I don't want to get into that that you need to have, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Steven. Um, I also see a question here. Someone is asking, um, you know, where is the, you know, in pursuing a career in any of these fields, where would you recommend one begin from? And I want to assume that person asking is a fellow or is a potential fellow in the 3MTT program. So, of course, um, signing up to the 3MTT program and being accepted is a um, really great place to start your career in any of these fields. And um, one question still to you, Stephen. Um, someone is asking how can AI transform Nigeria technology and for a business person, how can I use AI to transform my local business? So I, I think you should also use this question to kind of still share like final um advice, you know, to anyone who is um, you know, 
thinking of pursuing this field who is in that, um, you know, take towing the line of becoming an AI ML expert. Yeah, so I, I want to get you clearly. What's the first question? Sorry. The, the question is, um, how can AI transform Nigeria technology? That's really broad. Right. And okay. for a business person, how can I use AI to transform my local business? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, for one, I think the lowest hanging fruits at the national level, is it really productivity side? Uh, I think there's a statistics that a lot of the um, a lot of the Nigerian workforce isn't really in the productive sector. So let's let's say, for example, you're in the productive sector, meaning you're in a white collar job. A lot of the things you do can actually be augmented by AI. Most of most of the productive time that people spend are either maybe coming up with emails, responding to emails, or you know, or you know, typing out documents or proposals or things like that. These are things that you know that AI can actually help augment. And you focus on your major knowledge work. You know, if there's anything like you know, being strategic about how you work and stuff like that. You know. It's, it's going to be more productive because sometimes you ask people, what did they spend their time on in the office? They're like, oh, I responded to emails. Or I was helping my boss uh, come up with this proposal or things like that. You know, these things will sort of hasten. Now, now that's really the lowest hanging fruit, meaning you have ChatGPT, right? It's free, you know, or, you know, it's paid about $20. So that's the lowest hanging fruit. Now, on top of that, there are really sectors and industries, you know, that, that really enable uh, the pillars of our local, you know, economy. You have the farmers. You have the farmers who are building, like, uh, you know, doing the, the food industry and everything. And fundamentally, I'm, I mean, we're in Nigeria, so we know the realities of this thing is that technology is only secondary, right? A lot of the issues that we are facing, you know, I, I know I'm on camera, so I probably shouldn't be saying, uh, but a lot of the issues that we are sort of facing is, you know, can't really be, you know, primarily solved by technology. I think, you know, fundamentally, you have to fix the human layer first before you, you know, think about the technology itself, because at the end of the day, the technology is there and nobody's using it, right? You can't help, you, you know, you can't help or neglect it. So, but assuming, you know, let's say, you know, human layer is really good and then we're going to technology. I mean, there are industries like the farming sector, for example, that can really be aided by AI. I mean, farmers these days are scarce with knowledge, you know. Uh, you can have systems that, you know, can quickly ask, answer questions like, you know, bringing ChatGPT to farmers, but with like SMS, if they don't have access to the internet, they can get like access to uh, SMS responses from some of these uh, things that can help them understand how to prepare, you know, how to prepare manure for, you know, the rabbits or if the rabbits are sick, what should they do? A lot of rural, a, a lot of our produce are in the rural areas and, you know, farmers are there to sort of, uh, and most of these farmers are not, don't have access to technology. So they can really use the systems to improve productivity, right? When, you know, imagine they are responding in their local dialects or local languages, or they can make a call and then there's an automated response to these guys, you know, to help them understand how to plant better or how to harvest their maize crop or stuff like that. So that's, I, I mean, in the farming industry, there are so many things like the logistics area, it, you know, help optimize logistics and everything. And there are also others in this education area, for example, you know, as a student, you know, you want a study assistant, you know, how can that really help you, you know, improve your knowledge more? How can that help you, you know, gain more perspective? Or, you know, if you're looking for a job, for example, you know, how can it help you understand what your skill gaps are, you know, relative to the types of jobs you're looking out for? So there's a plethora, and that's why I said AI is after electricity, really, there's a claim that AI is really the most important technology of our time because there's a lot of things that it can unlock. You know, so far anywhere that has to that has to do with a computer, you know, that can come in, whether it's from a phone, a small phone, to a large supercomputer, AI could probably even play a really good role, and especially in terms of strategy and implementation as well. So that's it. I, there's so much to talk about here. I don't really want to get into into that because I believe there are you know companies that are really solving interesting problems with AI both in the nation and Pan-African this day. So um, yeah, on the side of the, the local business, I think it can really help a lot. You know, a lot of the local businesses, uh, small businesses these days, you're probably, you don't, people, most people, most small business owners don't even know how to write the business plan, right? It's as easy as going to the chat GPT and say, hey, you know, this is my context. I do, I sell this, you know, how do I come up with a business plan? That's one way it can help. The other way it can help is okay. I'm stuck with this. I don't. I don't have customers. For example, I cannot get customers. This is where I am. You when you once you're able to prompt your way and describe these things to these AI systems, they can offer suggestions that you don't have to pay a big consultants from like um, McKinsey or you know or you know uh, any of these big four companies to be able to give you these ideas, right? 
you know, you can get these ideas at the finger of your uh, at your fingertips, you know, and use that to be able to improve your business. Sometimes your business might be stuck in the fact that, you know, you're losing money on some certain things, right? You can ask the system, you know, how can I show up this particular, this, you know, this is, this is the context. So how can I do my tax? There, there, there are some systems that really help you do your, not really do your taxes, but really help you understand, you know, how to audit your, your financial records properly to be able to help you report taxes well. So, I mean, there are tools that really help with, uh, with that regard. And if you're running digital marketing as well, and you want to, um, come up with blog posts and stuff like that. Obviously, you can use some of these things to generate, although search engines are cracking down on that now, but you can also try to use those to get more traffic to your website if you're a digital business or if you're an offline business, you know, how can you engage with more customers offline? So search some of these things. And the more you start to search, the more you realize that so much knowledge on the internet from different people, from people past, is really embedded in some of these systems and they can give you the strategy to be able to go. Now it's left for you as a business owner to implement and then try some things and see if it works. Try some of these ideas and see if it works and stuff like that. So it's kind of like a companion for you as a local business. You don't have to hire a lot of talents anymore to be able to get things done. You know, If you're looking for SEO advice, reach out to it and then try to see if, if you can implement it or if you can't You know, work with other people to implement some of these things for yourself as well. Uh, I'm, I, I don't run a local business, so I don't have all the context, but I believe that, you know, this is really where it can help with being a companion for, you know, for your business. And I really have given all the knowledge that, that I think I can practice, you know, that's, that's what I would say. Hi, Steven. Are you still speaking? Because I can't. Yeah, I hear you. That helps. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Steven. I think you've really done justice to the machine learning AI field. And I hope whoever is listening today has, you know, gotten enough context as to what this field entails, um, you know, what the career trajectory is like, and, you know, you are better equipped to pursue a career in this field. Um, so um, um, to you, Prince, um, what, are there any final things you would like to share to, you know, a potential data science um, professional who is listening out there today? What are some of the things um, such a person should you know, um, focus on to aid their learning, what should they um, ensure that they learn or like tools they should focus on to, you know, keep them better better equipped for um, becoming a data science professional? Okay, thank you so much, Dolly. I would say um, essentially uh, concentrate on the things that um, machines cannot do, yeah? Leverage on technology as much as you can. Use chat GPT, use Copilot. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. That's the fastest way to uh, becoming professionally uh, proficient. You know, there's so much help you can get already. AI can help you to do a lot of things. You can uh, uh, become uh, good at using prompts to even generate code that can be helpful to you. Of course, I wouldn't advise you to rush into using prompts or using AI tools to generate code because it comes with its own risk and its own problems. So you have to first understand the basics of coding, understand the basics of, um, of uh, using some of these tools that you require. And once you're very proficient at uh, using it in the basic level, do not waste too much time trying to be the best um, programmer out there. That's why you have these AI tools that can help you with that, Copilot, ChatGPT, Gemini, and the rest of them. Now concentrate a lot on what the computers cannot do for now. And one of those things is what I was talking about initially, which is programmatic thinking. I can't talk about that enough. Learning how to understand the problem and how to create a problem from a human perspective. Think you know, on pen and paper, try to process your solution. First, write it down. There is something called pseudocode for those who already know how to code. And you know how important pseudocoding is towards the process of um, generating your solutions in code because that helps you to put your thoughts together. In the same way, write out your solutions. For example, you see a problem. Uh, the problem you've identified is that um, uh, farmers are finding it difficult to get their products from the rural location 
to the urban centers. What do you think the solution can be? First, what is the volume of products that they are generating in the first instance? What are the problems that they are facing? How can we use the information? How can we democratize information to solve those problems? When you think out your solutions on paper, it is much, much easier to go ahead and deploy this in a proper project. So uh, what I would advise to wrap everything up is rightly classify your problem into what you can solve leveraging technology and what you absolutely need to think through yourself as a human. Pay more attention and give more priority to those things you need to do as a human because technology keeps improving and it will continue to improve. Of course, the line gets blurred every day, but in tech, you live one day at a time, you know? So uh, look at the problems that are solved already leverage on technology as much as you can because that's what the most productive people out there do. You find uh, people out there, your, your competition is actually leveraging on all the help they can get from tech. And at the end of the day, it improves their productivity, improves their bottom line and makes them better at what they do. So that's what you should be doing as well yourself. You should look at 3 entities is a great place to start, great place. It doesn't get more basic than this. We have in the beginner cohorts, we are starting from the scratch and we are taking it up from there. So you're starting right from ground zero, you know? And from there, you just have the destiny in your hand. Some would learn faster than others because of how committed they would be. And uh, the watchword is practical, practical, practical. Continue to work on projects, get your hands dirty, make mistakes. Uh, encounter errors in your coding, solve, uh, solve the errors and just continue moving. And I think if you do all of this in no time, you would be an outstanding data professional. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, um, um, Prince, for that, uh, for sharing all that. It was very insightful, you know, talking about the data science field. I'm pretty sure um, our fellows out there who are listening would have, you know, gotten a better understanding and insights as to what this field entails. Um, Frank, um, I'll be trying this question to you just to summarize as we wrap up, if we are able to speak now, um, what would you say, uh, oops, okay, we lost him, unfortunately. Okay, um, so thank you so much everyone for joining so far. And I'm sure this um, you've gained so much from this webinar today. Um, there's a lot to gain from either of these fields. And as we've all listened today, these um, various tech fields are unique in themselves. And, you know, I've seen a couple of questions where people are asking, oh, can I start from zero? Can I start, I'm a novice. Can I start learning um, these fields? Where do I start from? I mean, nobody was born with a prior knowledge of what data science is or, you know, artificial intelligence or data analytics. We all started from somewhere. I'm sure our experts here can um, attest to that. They all started from somewhere, they built themselves. And, you know, just like the popular phrase or sentence, learning never ends. So um, if there's anything you've gotten from um, today's webinar is to, you know, put in that effort to, remain dedicated to the course. And of course, someday um, you become a professional and an expert in the field and hopefully tell your story. So once more, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. And um, at this point, we'll be wrapping things up. Um, Demi, I don't know if you'd like to share anything at this point. Um, that'll be all from my end. Thank you so much, everyone.